let's start and welcome to Architectural Acoustics Lecture for Acoustic Quantities. So this will be the, the most engineering, the heaviest math rich class but thereby probably also the most informative. I expect some of the th things we've discussed so far you have heard of already, and I expect that most of the things that come up today will be slightly new. And there is stunts. So uh, I will um, probably skip this. Any questions about this? Speed, distant time, basic ratio manipulation, wavelength, speed of sound, time, all these things are fairly straightforward. Wavelength frequency, we kind of j went through this briefly already. Inverse proportion, okay? Reciprocal values. These are the crucial terms here. So if one variable grows, the other one is reduced. That's what we call inverse proportion or reciprocal relationship. Okay, and here we have a reciprocal relationship between frequency and wavelength. Okay, as you increase the frequency, the wavelength decreases and vice versa. Fairly straightforward. Uh, now, sound pressure level. I've kind of introduced this term already. We've talked about decibels. Uh, make sure you don't get confused because decibels can be used for a variety of quantities. Okay, that, that's typically the source of confusion. Obviously, I said you're not going to be uh, asked to perform any calculations this year, so you can kind of take it with a pinch of salt or without anything. But in essence, what, when typically when people talk about dBs, they talk about dB SPL in relation to the uh, audible sound threshold. Okay, and then it seems like we are talking about absolute values, actual values, but these are all in relation to the threshold of hearing, which is zero dB. Okay, so few things, you kind of know this already, what are the levels uh, typically that we are surrounded by. Here another uh, lovely graphic, all nice and straightforward. Now come the interesting bits. So when we add decibels, uh, by the way, I should always say that uh, watch out for the 10 factor here or the 20 factor there. Uh, but in essence, it's just for us to have an idea of what's going on, what's happening. In essence, what you can remember is 2 plus 2 in acoustics is less than four typically okay when we do decibel adding up we don't we cannot just sum them if i have two sources one is 50 db the other one is 45 they won't add up to 95 okay so dbs don't add up like that they add up like this okay so it's a complex thing complex looking thing although you can probably go through this calculation quite quickly. I don't know, you see a few laptops, if anyone is inclined. All you do is you put in your dB values into level one, level two, as many levels as you want. So you could do this fairly quickly, 10 to the power of 35 over 10, or in essence, 10 to the power of 3.5, 10 to the power of four, 10 to the power of 4.2. Okay, you add these up, take the log 10 of that, do 10 times this and do the sum. Okay, so um, one thing that you can remember, we have a rule of thumb, which is called the 10 dB rule. And it goes like this. If you add two sources and one is 10 dB louder than the other one, you can actually neglect the softer source. Okay, it's that bad. So if, if you want to do the math here, what you could do is 30 plus 40 dB. You're trying to add two sources of 30 and 40 dB, and you will get something like 40.6. So if the softer source is 10 dB, or obviously uh, even softer than that, then you will not have 
any significant contribution from that source. Yes? So in essence, what you're saying is that if your ads in China add up like 30 dB to 40 dB, it would be around like 40 something. It's pretty much 40, yeah. Uh -huh. So, so for, for, you know, rule of thumb, for just kind of considering things in your head, uh, you can neglect the software source if it's more than 10 dB softer. Okay. Um, so obviously, if you want to do the math, do it. Uh, this is a bit more uh, informative, I would hope. Uh, actually, I just realized I don't have the... On the recording, it's just this. Can I do this while I'm doing it? Yeah, probably better idea. Let's just make sure that there is some original slides on the recording as well. Okay, so uh, what I... Interested, more interested in you guys getting um, is the ability to read graphs. Okay, so first thing when you have a graph is familiarize yourself with the axes and figure out what is it supposed to say. Okay, so what are we looking at? We're looking at increment in dB to be added to the higher level and we're looking at difference between two levels being added. Okay, so this is where you can read the 10 dB rule from. So if the difference between two levels that you're adding is 10 dB, then the amount you're adding to the higher level will be 0 0.4, 0 0.35, something like this. Okay, so from this graph, you should be able to read out how much do I have to, so for example, if I ask you how much dB or how many dB? Much dB? Many dB, I guess. How it's kind of strange. How many, decibels, yeah. how many decibels, yeah? So if I add 50 and 53 dB, what do I get? Can you read that from the graph? Around 1.8 something. Is that how many dB I get? Uh, no, the difference. So the answer is 50 plus 53 will be? 68. Nope. 68. 63 point something. Any other ideas? 54.8. 54.8. I like that most, yes. So we have difference of 3 dB, 50 plus 53. How much do we have to add to the louder source? 1.8. Okay, so 54.8. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, That's good. That's great. It's typically better to be convinced of something wrong and then learn the real thing rather than to just have the real thing served. So um, that's great stuff. Shall we do one more? How about 100 dB and 105 dB? What do I get? Uh, 106.3? Yeah. So the difference between the two levels is, hundred, uh, is 5. So to the louder one, I have to d add 1.3, whatever. So it will be 106.3. Okay. Can we do this with ages of uh, romantic uh, lovers? Not quite, because obviously we would have to have... Uh, it, we would have to start thinking about group arrangement, I'm afraid. <laughs> anyway. Um, Okay, so we have something which is a shorthand for this. Obviously, you're not going to make a living from these equations, at least likely. Although I do suggest you do. I'm making a living out of these equations, and it's a good living. So uh, if you want to add s equal sources, sources of equal loudness, you have a shorthand. But obviously, this equation is derived from the previous one, so you don't really need to learn it anyway. And now you get a basic idea that Essentially, you need to add a lot of things to start pushing the dB up, okay? And there are some implications, right? So if you say, well, I have, a, I have a club in my basement, like you normally do, I guess, everyone does, and you have a PA in there, and you're like, okay, I'm going to double the amount of speakers straight off, right? I'm going to just buy one more PA and stick it in there, which sounds great. But if you think about it, actually, you're not earning a horrible amount of dB, right? So um, 
There you go. Uh, okay, now in terms of discussing SPL, uh, often you will have a stipulation that there is a weighting curve uh, applied. Uh, the most popular and the most relevant is the A weighting curve, and this is what it is. So essentially what you do, what you can do, is if you have a readout of SPL across the spectrum, which is measured, and you want to do the A-weighted version of that, for every frequency you would have to essentially subtract or add a few dB or more than a few. Okay, so typically it's, they line up at 1K, so your measured uh, SPLs and the A-weighted SPLs. So the reason why we do this is of psychoacoustical nature. Next week we will do psychoacoustics, so uh, some of this will come back again. In essence, what you're looking at is that you need to push bass much louder in order for it to be perceived as equally loud. So typically this A weighting curve, as you see, it's a kind of an approximation. Uh, I will show you the equal loudness contour or the fletcher munson curve, which is a bit more detailed, which is actually measured. Uh, and evidently, everyone has a slightly different hearing anyway. But this is the kind of average that engineers work with. And typically, we use this in order to uh, assess noise nuisance and similar things. Uh, because uh, you have B and C weighting as well. It's a kind of an identifier, letter A. Okay? So this is the one that is typically most frequently used um, to assess the nuisance from external noise levels and such. Uh, so you actually have to push the bass much louder for it to be audible. Um, is it like as I said, it is not strictly psychoacoustical because for psychoacoustics you would have more detail. It would be a measured curve. I'm going to talk about this next week in more detail when we deal with psychoacoustics. Okay, uh, now uh, I've mentioned already that essentially in acoustics we, you are likely to encounter three different dBs, so to speak. One is the SPL, the most straightforward one, the most useful one. The other one would be sound intensity level. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this much in this class or otherwise, but it's worth knowing the, the difference between SPL and, um, and intensity is that with intensity you are considering an area to be the receiver. So there is an additional thing in there, so to speak, which is uh, the area. Uh, now, the point is that SPL, as you might be aware, is very much dependent on your distance from the sound source. Okay, so it is something that describes the receiver and something that describes a receiver as a point receiver. So a receiver which does not have any extent. Okay, the thing that you can imagine is that if I have a larger membrane, and a smaller membrane, the larger membrane will actually receive more pressure. Okay? So if you want to go from SPL, from a point receiver, to an actual physical body or a surface that receives the sound pressure, then you get to sound intensity. Okay? And then the third one is this one, is the sound power. So the first two were all about the receiver, either point receiver or with a spatial extent. This one has to do with the sound source. So we can describe the sound source as having a certain power in dB. Okay, so this is sound power level. And what you can do then is you can figure out the SPL from the sound power level. Okay, uh, LW W is there frequently for your power. Uh, that's the equation. Obviously, we don't need to learn it by hand. The thing to, to take away from this one is how the sound pressure level depends, obviously, on the power of the source, but it also depends on what we call sound source directivity, uh, which could describe the sound source, 
right? So if I have a sound source that has an equal amount of power, but one is directional, the other one is omnidirectional, then you kind of expect that the omnidirectional will uh, give you less SPL at the receiver. Right? But the interesting thing is that this directivity is not only about the sound source, it is actually about the surfaces near the sound source. Okay, so what we have is this Q, which will come up there, and you probably know it already, this would be uh, 3 dB, because I have a 10 as a multiplier, never mind the details. In any case, I will significantly increase the SPL at a distance if my sound source is laid on a flat surface, a reflective flat surface, okay? If it is uh, in a corner, although the corner is probably this one, how would you call this? It's uh, at a junction of two walls, right? Uh, then the Q factor increases even more, and if it's in the corner of the room, surrounded by three reflective surfaces, then you get even more SPL. Okay, so there is a huge difference between what we call the free field situation and the situation whereby the sound source is in a room or otherwise. Okay, so I'm not sure how far you've gotten with, um, um, with the experiments, but actually this is the thing that should have become clear with our first SPL meter-based uh, experiment that you don't get the SPL which you would expect in the free field if you're in the room. What happens in the room? Wh where is it louder if you increase the distance? Near the walls? Huh? Near the, nearer to the walls? Yeah, in the room it is louder. So if you have a free field situation, right, you double the distance, you uh, are uh, getting 6 dB less, but in a room, because of all the reflections, because of the energy kind of staying within the space, more or less, you will have less reduction of level with the increase of distance. Okay, so those are the kind of the basic things to understand. And then evidently distance from source. If you increase distance, then the SPL goes down. Okay, so that's your sound power level that describes the sound source, right? So we had two dBs for receivers, and we have this one uh, for source. Um, I think this is just that same story. And if you um, do the math, please do. There's a directivity effect. I kind of explained this just now. Okay, now with the SPL decay with distance, again, we have an equation, if you're interested, first distance, second distance, and there you go. Th there is one thing, though, about this sound power level. Can anyone figure it out? Th there is something really weird about uh, this equation, and actually the concept itself. I should have actually said it, but it's good, I, I, I still remember it. What's really weird with this idea that the sound, uh, if, if the SPL decreases with increasing distance, what happens with the decreasing distance if I come closer to the sound source? Increase. Should increase, okay? So why is this funny? Well, what happens if my distance is zero? What does this equation yield? No. Well, it depends on what you're doing. If, if you're just a mathematician, it blows your mind, or you just, you know, disregard it, say it's, you cannot um, uh, calculate, you cannot divide by zero, okay? If you're using a computer programming language, you might get not a number or something. If you're using psychedelics, you might get enlightened. <laughs> <coughs> you don't know what's gonna happen, but in any case, there is an issue with infinitely decreasing the distance. So that's something to be aware of. And in acoustics, what we have is a term which is near field. 
And in the near field of the source, we actually have a different set of equations. So it can be very close to the source, and then this essentially breaks down. Yes. Well, OK, so you're saying that if we add 0 right, as a distance, it's going to make like the equation awkward, and it won't work, basically. Yes. OK. But it kind of makes sense that if you were at 0 distance from the source, you are technically the source. Yeah, but you shouldn't get an infinite amount of energy at the source. I know, I know but kind of you cannot be at zero distance of the source. There is always going to be like, even um, like a very small like distance from your ear to where the sound is coming from. Yeah, but the point is that even if I replace one millimeter in here, yeah. I will all get already get the kind of power which is totally out of this world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not just the zero. It is everything within near field. Now, for different acoustic sound sources, you will have a dis different near field value. Okay. Anyway, it's, different equation to calculate it's a different field. equations for near field. In fact, one of the ways you can uh, recognize a well-studied acoustician is he will never say for monitors to be near field. He will call them close field. Because near field as a term was coined already far before we had these active monitors in the studios. So uh, a kosher acoustician will uh, make a distinction here. OK? But just so you know, very close to the sound source, weird things happen and different equations hold. Uh, good. Decay with distance, that's fairly clear. We kind of discussed this. Another lovely graph here. OK? Shall I do a little uh, task here? So we have, in fact, we should be able to verify what was being said. Okay, so if I double the distance, if I go from five meters to 10 meters for this very source, I've actually lost six dB. Make sense? So what happens if I triple the distance? Okay, so five to 15, how much did I lose? 10. Almost 10. Nine. Something like nine, yeah. I would have to do, quadruple the distance, and then I should be losing how much? 12. Okay, should be double the 6. So for every doubling, you get an extra 6. Yes? That graph was just as it's x, y, you know, in the middle. Um, is there a reason why this, this is just dizziness? Or it's just a random graph that okay. someone has made, and it, that wasn't me. Uh, okay, so that's essentially what you're looking at and also what you see here that looks a bit random but this is not random this is crucial that we have a near field where things happen differently and you also see it here so this would be the line that corresponds to this equation that you've just seen and you can imagine that if you continue this line things start to get increasingly unlikely okay so you just stop at a certain distance is there a fixed point where the near field. Yeah, it depends on the sound source. Yeah, I won't go into that. Um, okay, so those were point sources. Now, in acoustics, especially environmental acoustics, there will be some more detail towards the end of the module about this. Uh, typically, people often have the need to calculate with line sources. Can you think of a line source? A source of acoustic noise which is a line rather than a point. Periodic system? A uh, line <laughs> array, yes, maybe. Kind of works. Obviously, it's kind of short line. Depends on how much cash you have. The typical example here is a highway. Okay, so in environmental acoustics, if you have a highway, you actually need a different equation to estimate the, there are the little cars, to estimate the SPL at a different distances just so you have a sense of this. Obviously, it will be slightly more. OK, so those were the basic uh, dBs uh, discussed. Now we're going to get to reverberation time and reverberation in general. OK, so I've announced this already. We have a T60, which is uh, the decay, the time it takes for the uh, field to decay by 60 dB. Okay, uh, 
And typically, if we have a perfectly diffuse sound field, which we typically don't, but never mind, then we would have a perfect exponential decay, or on a dB plot, we will have a straight line. So we're going to kind of consider this straight line, and when is it the case, when, is, when it is not. Uh, I introduced the impulse response already. Here's the spectral shape of a gunshot. Uh, I didn't bring in the clapper. I don't have guns yet. I probably could get some <laughs> for, for the acoustics here. Uh, but in any case, uh, I'll skip that. It's kind of misplaced anyway. Um, okay, so in terms of the 60 T60, one of the things to know is that it's unlikely that you can directly measure it because of the noise floor and the maximum SPL required. So typically you would measure the T30. I believe I s explained this already. Okay, now uh, what are the other reasons why... Uh, what are the reasons why uh, we don't have a linear decay? Okay, that, that's, that's, uh, that's one of the interesting things. In fact, I'm not sure I'll have to test it before, uh, before making a practical of it, but I think we should be able to get the decay curve and assess whether a certain room has a linear decay, whether it has a hump or, a, or a, what's the opposite of the hump? A dip, right? Um, so what does it depend on? Well, it essentially depends on, as the reflections happen, whether the, the initial reflections, the early reflections, have a higher level compared to the late reflections or the other way around. Okay, that's what we're looking at. And typically, if you have a funny-shaped room, this could change. Also, if you have absorption arranged differently. Who can say something about this? If I want to have a hump in my reverberation decay, right? how do I have to arrange absorption in the room? There's not a certain order of reflections the reason for that. Hump. Certain, namely? Yeah. So I want to ha have a hump, which yeah. means that the reverberation level is fairly high before it drops ra radically. Which means that early reflections are higher frequency. not high frequency, higher amplitude. level, amplitude, yeah. So how do I achieve that? Well, I don't absorb them, right? So in which areas of the room do I typically get early reflections? The new, ro like new walls and stuff. Yeah, the kind of center of different walls. I mean, obviously it depends on the source and receiver. But in a general situation, if this is the source, you are the receivers, then halfway between us, on all the surfaces, you have your first reflection points. Okay? And then also if you think about the second order reflections, which is also typically part of the early reflections, it is this rear wall, that rear wall, back and forth, like left, right to you. So still all of these points of reflection are kind of in the middle of the walls, mm -hmm. okay? So if I want to have a hump in my reverb, where do I put the absorption? Corners? Corners, yeah. So I actually try to absorb the late reflections. I'm trying to reduce the late reflections, okay? So why corners? Because that's where the late reflections will be more present. As I explained, the, the first order, second order reflections are typically in the middle of the surfaces. And the late reflections will be in the other places. Obviously, they will be in the middle as well. Maybe you remember from last time the, the little sketch of all the reflections. Yes? So I'm not trying to influence you there with the latest, but I heard that there is a chess, Gothic chess, Gothic style, mm -hmm. and that um, when it when the thing is built, it has a lot of Yes, this is possible. Yes, of course. So this is a phenomenon we call whispering galleries. And uh, what happens with this, if you have a curved surface, not that I have one here, but uh, maybe I can describe it with this bucket. 
So if you, if you imagine a curved surface, what happens, you saw me explain things about uh, reflections actually adding to the SPL at the receiver. So what happens if you have a curved surface that the reflections kind of stick to the surface and keep going. So if it's a reflective surface, uh, actually there is a, there's some good uh, sketches. Maybe I can find one uh, quickly. Um, so uh, b -b -b whispering galleries. And there are actually two phenomena here. Uh, I'll explain it in a second. Uh, let's see, images, <coughs> this one. Okay, so, and, and th here it's actually not even uh, drawn as a huge amount of reflections, but actually you could do this. The, the important thing is, if you want to achieve this effect, the source has to be orientated uh, in sideways direction. So if you have a curved surface like this and the listener should hear you very well, they will hear you better if you talk sideways than directly. Okay, yeah. because this wall sort of carries the reflection. And in fact, I think in uh, very odd, like laser tech and some other uh, domains, they actually use this phenomenon. I can't remember now, but it's really exciting. No? The other thing that happens is if you have an elliptical uh, surface, right, like ellipse, an ellipse is defined by two focal points. And what you get is that if you're at the one focal point, the receiver at the other focal point will actually have the sound very loud. Okay, and these are sometimes mixed up. If you read something on uh, whispering galleries, sometimes they throw in bits about elliptical uh, surfaces. Uh, but those are two kind of really interesting, strange phenomena whereby the sound is much louder than you would expect. Can you do it the other way around with, like, instead of uh, increasing the, um, the long delay, the long decay, can you just increase the early reflections? And no. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, we can go back to that. Uh, so what would be the way? So if you, if you want, so we talked about having a hump in your reverb. Uh, we can talk about having a dip. How would you achieve a dip? Right. Where do you put the absorption? Yeah. yeah, in the middle of the surfaces, you actually treat, you absorb the early reflections, and then the late reflections will be potentially louder than expected. Okay, which is typically what you have in the studios. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing with these reflections is that uh, we'll talk about this in some detail, but the early reflections uh, typically enhance your perception of the sound source. And then you have a range uh, maybe between 50 milliseconds to a few hundred milliseconds where it is definitely detrimentary to the sound. And then all the longer reverberation is again kind of helping it. It makes it sound better. There's a kind of a dead zone for reflections that are in, in terms of audition, let's put it like that. But we'll see this is actually something that relates to what you're listening to. Okay. Uh, resonant modes, how would they affect, if you have a resonant mode, how would they affect the reverberation curve? If you have a strong resonant mode. at different uh, parts? If you look at the spectrum, yes. But we're looking at the reverberation curve. Mm. Well, resonant mode is specific frequency? Or is yeah, yeah. So we talked about room modes last time. Yeah. What are the three types of room modes? Actual. Axial. Um, What's the second one? Coaxial. No, no. Coaxial is a speaker type where you have two membranes one inside the other. So we have axial modes. Those are trapped between two surfaces, trapped between four surfaces. 
in a plane are tangential modes. And finally, no. oblique. OK, cool. Um, yeah, so if you have a strong resonant mode, it will ring on. OK, that's what you can uh, expect. Cool. Uh, reverberation times. Uh, I mentioned the T30, I mentioned the T60, but actually you can put any index to the T and then you can figure out that is the reverberation time for that specific uh, duration. Or that's the, I should say, the reverberation decay for that specific time. We also have an EDT, early decay time, which is the take decay, decay time from 0 to minus 10 dB, just so you know. Typically, what we have in acoustics is that we have certain terms, and then in the index, we specify something about that that gives us more detail. You will see this coming later on as well. Um, practical example here. What we have is a continuous noise that suddenly stops. And then you can use this also to estimate the reverb time. We will do reverb time with fuzz measure kind of out of the box anyway. So that should be more straightforward. A little bit of math there. OK, so early decay time uh, is quite crucial. Okay, It is typically controlled by the geometry of space. Okay, so the geometry of a space has to do with early reflections, most of all. Okay, so if I modify this space, if I splay the walls, if this would be kind of uh, oriented towards you, there would be a massive difference here. In fact, what I think we should do, um, I don't know if you want to sacrifice the psychoacoustics for this or uh, anything else, kind of reluctant to sacrifice anything. But uh, Luke asked us, asked me, to potentially measure this space. Luke is very good at uh, obtaining funds for improving our work environment, which is great. I mean, you've seen the, the 89 studio pff, compared to what it was last year. It looks good subs there right now. They have everything there. It really but looks good. Subs, why not? I thought it's around sound. Because for and? Uh, sound formats, you need a certain spec for low frequency side thing, things. Right. So it it depends. It's 5.2, this one. I think they one. added tube to uh, just remote, basically. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you were into this, the positioning of the subs in the room is a really big, big topic. In fact, it's a kind of a good question because typically with a single sub, you have less danger. Mm. Especially to for surround, I mean, like, you know, if it's like well, 5.1. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be the standard. But obviously here you also want stereo and things like this. So I think, I, I'm not sure if I want to sacrifice a theoretical lecture unless everyone says, yeah, let's do it. Because we could uh, try to measure this space in a way that we get cash to improve it. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to tap on so. Yeah, so fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing, I think that we can do this anyway because we can use the 89. Uh, there's a really interesting ping in that room, which is kind of sweet. I like it. Ping? Yeah. Well, if you clap, it goes thing. Oh. There, there's, there's something funny. Uh, so we could also go in there and see if we can improve that kind of real, real life. In 88, like when you clap and when you get like high frequencies, you make a really shaky note to create some kind of resonance. Yeah, yeah, you get, you hear this ping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we could try to discover that. We can take a big speaker and kind of point it in different directions and have you guys listen to which, wh what is it that makes the noise and so on. Um, is there a way to measure like the room frequency? Like the frequency of the room, like the overtones? Like Did I not explain that in detail last time? How is your uh, sh early decay, memory, early decay for your memory? Yes, it is. <laughs> I guess it's not great, huh? Yeah, that was the topic of the last lecture. Yeah, exactly. But like, uh, I don't remember like having it like for a specific frequency. Like, okay, this area is like 
uh, I don't know, like F sharp, you know, like the. Depends how you interpret the data that you collect. F sharp is not a specific frequency. F sharp is pitch class. Mm -hmm. Pitch class. Pitch class. Yeah. I mean, yeah, obviously, but you know what I'm saying. Like, I don't remember that, like, you know. Well, you don't remember because it wasn't. I would never say that this room resonates at F sharp mm -hmm. because it's just not something an acoustician will say. It's something that a music tech student without understanding of acoustics would say. <laughs> yeah. So that's why, I'm, that's why I'm saying try to adopt the terminology that, uh, that gives you a higher profile maybe. Especially because you understand the underlying terms, it's just that you're being a bit lazy in a kind of uh, offhand approach. Am I right? Can be argued. Exactly. But we won't do that now. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a worthwhile recap anyway. Things that are important uh, are worth repeating. So what we can do and what we will do next week is we're going to measure a room mode. How are we going to do that? Well, typically we will have an idea of where to expect one. So we will first estimate it. How do we estimate a room mode? Well, axial modes are quite easy to estimate because we just look at the distance of two parallel walls and we will expect a mode at that frequency. So we will expect a spectral peak in the analysis right there. Uh, if we look at tangential and oblique modes, it is something we won't estimate by uh, hand, but we will just enter the room dimensions into one or the other room mode calculator and it will spit out those frequencies as well. Uh, the reason why it will be the only way of possible of doing this because we won't be able to distinguish between other resonances that could have to do with speakers and microphones and who knows what. So we kind of narrow the window of where we're trying to find a room mode and then we'll find it there. Okay? But that's, that's going to be the practical next week. Uh, Okay, so a uh, few more graphs of what we were just discussing. So this is your linear decay on a decibel scale. It actually looks like a line. If it's not a decibel scale, it would look like an exponential decay. Um, and then these are the two ways that this could be different, right? So kind of uh, spiking without significant early reflections and the other way around, humping with significant early reflections, uh, and how this affects the T30 versus T60. I guess it's fairly straightforward. OK, so uh, the thing to, to know is that the EDT, if it's very short, if you have early reflections, and we will discuss this to greater detail, you actually get clarity. Right, so you would think that, that having just the direct sound source is the most clear presentation of that sound source, but that's not true, in fact. Okay? And it's not just the fact of uh, you know, imagining early reflections building up. If you think, if you think about um, it spectrally, right? so typically sound sources, they will have a different spectral characteristic projected in different directions. So if I have reflective surfaces next to a sound source, then some of the frequencies that are not projected straight ahead will still arrive if they're reflected very near the sound source. And the time delay between the reflection and the uh, direct sound won't be that much. So it kind of fills up the sound. Okay, you can, you can probably experience this. I mean, I won't be moving this piano around or anything, but y you, you can ex experiment with this. Typically, you see in a recording situation, and increasingly we will talk about uh, actual real life scenarios, but in a recording situation, most people are convinced that they want, don't want any reflection. They want a dead room. Uh, there is a, a kind of a conviction uh, historically very valid but increasingly disappearing luckily that uh, just make sure you have a very dead 
uh, recording and then you can manipulate it afterwards the way it needs to be manipulated. Uh, and there's some issues with this. It, it really is an aesthetic decision in the end. But in any case, in the situations when you're not recording, knowing that early reflections are crucial is just important. The other day, probably you guys know the canteen. On Wednesday, there is a jazz night. Some of my friends are typically playing there. And they complain like no one else about the acoustic of that stage. Right? Why? Well, someone has put a curtain behind it. Right? It doesn't help. Okay, so typically what you want in order to hear your fellow musicians, you need early reflections. Right? So, so manipulating reflections is actually quite a complex business. Right? And typically you want the early ones. The early ones really help produce a full uh, sound so source. So why studios that I actually block them? Uh, we'll talk about this in more detail. Uh, in essence, in control rooms, it makes sense to avoid any coloration, any reflections. We'll talk about different control room design strategies. In recording rooms, it's an aesthetic choice. And you will find increasingly that people don't record in dead rooms. Okay, I mean, if you have a horrible acoustic, then it's better to deaden it than to have it but there is nothing that will match a beautiful acoustic which is desired for recording. Which is flat? Uh, it depends on the source material. It's an aesthetic thing. Uh, the, 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 this fascination with flatness is a bit of a marketing uh, outcome. Uh, if, you, if you read anything, uh, for example, some of the books, that are in the reading list. Who has read any? I started the one you said, but yeah. I haven't finished. Yeah, you will find that they are e extremely complex oh, right. sets of relationships, uh, which is a good way of understanding that if someone presents a simple acoustical relationship to you, you can be wary that it might be someone trying to sell you something, right? Uh, Acoustics is extremely complex. Everything that is simplified and works out of the box is just marketing. It's not science. It's not acoustics. Okay, so beware. Um, so yeah, with, with recording stuff, it depends what you want to record. Uh, some things sound great in certain places. Yes? Uh, last year, I was doing Return of Marlin and Return of Our Studios. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think it was that bedroom um, and what I was into some things. It is seven. It's actually a, a sign of a good performer that they adopt to the room. You might think that that's kind of over the top, but it actually works. In fact, I think you can even measure it. Uh, drummers will uh, adjust their tempo. Because if you have a very intense reverberation, you don't have that much space, right? So, so you actually slower the tempo down. Right, because typically it's you're, you're not drumming is not about you know pro providing dots in time it is about providing volume rhythm pulsation many other things right so th the sense of the size will have a lot to do with how much decay you have between the different hits so in a different environment you will probably play differently i know that uh, some djs did that uh, in sense of like bit matching and delays to kind of like measure the Set the BPM so the delays would be in sync with the room's like overtone frequencies. Uh, so delays in sync. Well, you would have to be a bit more uh, skeptical about this claim. So in the way that you figure out what would be a typical delay in relation to frequency. How do you relate these two? 
I, I didn't do it myself, so I don't know. I just yeah, that yeah. I, there was this DJ who basically like he measured the room, and he by measuring the room, like you know, he divided the BPM by measuring the room, and then he could know like what is like the best BPMs to use in that room. That sounds like a horribly uh, weak statement. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you have some detail there. I'll, I'll Google it again. Yeah, well, th that's the point. Online, you will find a lot of rubbish, you know. Oh, yeah, I didn't see And th this sounds know. like another, you know, I'm so cool because I do something that no one else does. Yeah. What I think would make more sense and can make sense is to set up your expander to fit the room, right? Because typically the decay of the bass drum is a crucial parameter that, you know, makes dance music breathe and kind of full and, and present and huge. Mm -hmm. And if you have a long bass drum decay in a reverberant space, it might be too much. If you have it in a dead space, it might be too little, right? And if you don't have a set whereby you have the parameter of your bass drum decay, what you can do is you can set up an expander or essentially an expander or a kind of a gate, kind of a soft gate to make sure that you can control the amount of decay in the bass frequencies. And then you can make sure that it's not too full, but it's not too tight, it's not too... Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that kind of makes sense, but to say that you can adjust the BPM to the room. He said this is basically, I played with Ricardo once in Australia, the stage and the dance floor were a bit below ground level with concrete walls. Before I went on, during this last record, he tells me 128 is the perfect tempo to play with the delay of the walls. He beat match the venue. So if you have a venue where you hear a decay like that, where you hear an echo, there is probably a problem. It's, it's, y you don't want a venue with, with an yeah, echo. Yeah, but like if, if there's a problem with the venue, and then he sees that according to like, you know, this is the BPM that like in, in sense of like decaying reflection is kind of better. I think that this DJ has not studied acoustics. I might be wrong. I don't think so, but he might uh, yeah, so if you, so you would have to, you know, when you read a statement like this, you know, th the point of studying acoustics is to be able to dissect it and figure out which parts of it may make sense. So first thing, you would have to show me a club where I have uh, an echo which corresponds to a rhythmical value, right? So if I go tuck, cuck. Okay, that is maybe a third of a second, 300 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So what is the distance of a reflection that will give me 300 milliseconds? It's huge. It's 300 times the width of my head. If you remember my rule of thumb for milliseconds, my head width is about one millisecond, actually less. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it has to be a huge room. Now the other thing that has to happen for this to sound as an echo is that all the other reflections may not be there. Right, so that, that's from the sketch of the previous uh, slides. You remember the, the uh, impulse response. Mm -hmm. Only if there is a gap in there, there was one of 35 milliseconds, you start to get a chance to perceive something which is an echo type phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? So you would have to have, I, I think it would be tricky to design a room which would have a clear echo like that and it is very uh, unlikely that such rooms exist and people just use them. Yeah? But what are the things that you can do, what you can go wrong to, to mess up with acoustics in terms of architectural decisions? What, yeah. what can make the echo, the reverse echo, happen in terms of acoustic, uh, architecturally? Uh, in terms well, of shape of the, the, the main thing you want is diffusion, right? So all the parallel surfaces will act as uh, essentially room mode uh, stimulants mm -hmm. and all the surfaces which are not parallel and surfaces which are randomized in their surface will act as a diffuser so they will disperse the sound more than reflect it directly. If you want to, if I need to imagine a situation where I actually have a room which will give me a musical uh, echo it would have to be a tunnel 
which has very strongly absorbed sides and a very reflective back end. And even then, the question is whether I would hear it, you know, very clearly. I mean, obviously, if I go to a valley in a forest, frequently, then I may find spots where you have, if you have, if probably if you are, um, like, at the bottom of the Lee Woods, you can try to have the huge cliffs of Clifton at maybe about 80, 90 meters across. That's the kind of situation where you can get a clap and a clap back. Uh, easily. You can predict that. And you could actually try to calculate what it is and all the rest. But typically you need very large distances. And in that situation, you see, the, the reason why you get the clap, just a second, is you don't have a tunnel which is insulated, but you also don't have those early reflections because all the, uh, all the rest of the sound disperses. And it's that one reflection which really stands out from the others. So it's not just about having that reflection at 300 milliseconds, it's about it standing out from the rest that allows you to perceive it. Yeah? Um, you can also get that phenomenon actually in uh, nuclear cooling towers. Sure. No, no, yeah, so if you, you put it sometimes in, uh, at the bottom of those. Yeah? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in, uh, they, in, in Germany, they have, they call it gasometer. It's like, they used to be gas storage silos uh -huh. and they have huge ones i think it was about 30 meters across and more than 100 meter height mm. and it's just spectacular you do this and it's like wow yeah it's like lighting up the yeah. whole the whole I room to one in the south of france actually as well yeah 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 and uh, i tried to at the time play my guitar inside that uh, cooling tower you see you can't imagine it's like you know, some notes are coming, some notes are going, it's like, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, and I think the worst thing adding here is that, uh, you know, there could be something, so we could figure out, so 300 milliseconds, what it needs to be, but I would say that uh, listening to it might actually be more accurate than, than, uh, than calculating it, okay? So you will see that, we will do this next week, you will measure the distance between the two walls and then you will measure that mode and measurement is always more real, right? Than the, I mean, in terms of acoustic measurement than the distance measurement, right? So that's an estimation. If you just measure the distance of the walls, if you predict what will be the echo time, but if you actually measure the echo time, that is more accurate, obviously. That is the actual echo time. Okay, cool. Uh, there's quite a few things more, so I'm probably going to run through these, but I'm really happy to have discussions and uh, questions asked. Uh, this is what you need to consider in terms of uh, audibility and suitability of reverb times. Typically, you would get masking, right? So if the reverb is huge and something soft happens after something loud, you might not be able to hear it fairly straightforward. Uh, here is a set of reverberation times. Okay, so when we say the reverberation time, typically it's T60. So this is the set for different musics. Uh, and obviously this is all acoustical sound sources. If you have speakers in the room, it's a different business altogether. This is milliseconds? Excuse me? Milliseconds? Yeah. No, sorry, seconds. Two and a half seconds. So that's a proper cathedral. Okay. Drama theater. Typically with, with control rooms, which, you know, clubs tend to uh, try and achieve, you have like zero, one, zero, two, zero, three seconds reverberation time. Uh, so we will talk about recording, uh, just kind of a, a set of targets that you might want to consider. So typically, you know, 0 0.5 and less is something that we appreciate as fairly dry room. Uh, cool. Uh, a little uh, graph of BBC targets. So the, the thing to, to uh, definitely understand is that with increasing room, something funny? 
Yeah, the serious, serious music. music. <laughs> serious music. Yeah, it's, it's what it's called, yeah? Uh, so what you expect and probably know is that with the increasing volume of the room, increasing size of the room, the reverberation time increases inevitably. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the reverberation time in relation to the room volume. Okay, another one of those uh, interesting things consider understanding a graph where the two axes are not uh, straightforward. Okay, so you see here that if you have a talking uh, sound source, right, depending on the volume of the room, you are adjusting the reverberation time. So if the room is increasingly larger, you just won't be able to get very short reverberation times. Okay, so that's those are the kind of the uh, what aims. Is volume and power of the room. Volume, uh, cube meters. Oh. But like, what's the um, volume is the is the product of the three dimensions of the room. Okay. Shall we try and do it for this room? Yeah. Maybe. Why not? Why not? What's the distance from that wall to this wall? Hell. You want me to measure by myself? Can you? Yeah. Go ahead. I think it's it's probably about 20 meters, maybe less. So this half is 10. I think it's less actually. It's probably about 17, 18 meters. Exciting. So I would say that's 18 meters. The ceiling height on average, which is in the middle of the room, is about 3 meters, I would imagine. So let's, let's call it 20, make it simple. So 20 by 3 is 60. And then this dimension, it's actually also similar. It's, uh, let's call it 20 as well. OK, so 20, 60, so that's 120. So we have 1,200 cubic meters. And you give or take 10 meters, 44. 10? Yeah, no chance. That's what I think. Don't trust it. <laughs> Um, so I, I estimated this room is here about 1,200 cubic meters. You can measure like this one, just like this compass. Yeah. You can just lie flat on the floor, you know your height, <laughs> and then see how many times you fit. It's not really crucial, but just so you have a, an idea, this is the kind of size room, bang in the middle, right? Not sufficient for serious music, obviously. But uh, drama, pop music, sounds like this lecture altogether. Yeah? Um, cool. Early sound. So uh, we talked about early decay time. Uh, now let's talk about clarity. Okay, now we're getting into more uh, un undiscovered acoustical ground. We have clarity index. Uh, and we have two, one is for music, one is for speech. And they are, it is supposed to describe the clarity of an acoustical environment. And in this case, this is for music, C80. So what we have is a threshold at 80 milliseconds. And we look at the level before, the early level, and the late level. Okay, and one over the other. So essentially, it tells us how much of the reflections arrive within 80 milliseconds and how much of the reflections arrive later. Why and did you say 80 milliseconds? Why that number? That's uh, experimentally found to be about right for human perception. Okay, in the case of music. In the case of speech, it is 50 milliseconds. And this has to do with the uh, undulations Undulation. Undulations. Oh. Undulation is a change. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, undulations over time, right? So you have more articulation in speech. If I say something really fast, okay, that was quite a few undulations within one second. Typically with music, it's not as fast. So we have a slightly different value. And uh, it should be clear, right? So if you have something on top of the uh, ratio line, right? That will be a straight proportion 
to the value, right? So it means that if the sound within 80 milliseconds is louder, I will have higher clarity, straight proportion. Inverse proportion, if the sound arriving later than 80 milliseconds is louder, more here, less here. I have less clarity. Okay, those are the kind of principles uh, really worth understanding. And what you have here is an omnidirectional measurement. Okay, so there is no distinction in terms of the directivity of the reflections which will come in later. Okay, so that's your clarity. Again, you see capital C is like our clarity. This is C80. So again, we have a situation when in the index we put a number that specifies something about what we're saying. Uh, here, is it, here it is visually. Okay, so you have a, an integral. That's your integral sign. So you're summing all the early reflections, you're summing all the late reflections, you're taking the ratio of those two, and that's what you get. Okay, so I'm kind of thinking this is something that we should be able to do and, and measure ourselves. In fact, in this room, that would be one of the interesting things. So what can you say about this clarity in relation to the listener position in the room? It varies. Yes. Except if Except what? Except if it, yes. It, it depends on the thing. So, for example, if I'm if I'm to deliver the lecture from here continuously, right? Then at the same distance there and there, you will have more clarity here, right? Because this early reflection will be within the. Well, in the case of speech, 50 milliseconds, yeah? What about amphitheaters, like the Greek ones or whatnot? Uh, yes, exciting places. So, shall we go? Did they take into account, like, <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Did they take into account, like, clarity in that case? Because it's no, it's experimentally designed it's thing. Experimentally designed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things, but typically, uh, you would have some it's like a wonder of the world. Sometimes it is difficult to explain uh, the acoustics. But uh, what you have there is stone, very reflective. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the key. In fact, what I've heard recently is that supposedly even Stonehenge was acoustically University considered. University of Manchester or something. Like yeah, yeah. Research about yeah. So if you have these huge blocks of stone, they act as very significant acoustic reflectors. You said that it was like designed to be acoustically like amplified or something, right? Don't use the word amplify. Mm -hmm. Acoustically treated. Yeah, it's 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 considered probably for its acoustics. Um, cool. So C eighty, I guess that's kind of clear. It's not the most complex acoustical quantity. We will have a look at some more complex ones. So C fifty for speech. C eighty for uh, music, speech intelligibility, so clarity, C50 says something about it. Here's a little thing, you probably know this already, but what we have in acoustics is another measurement of speech intelligibility, which is the speech transmission index. So this one is a bit more uh, focused on the characteristics of speech and the characteristics of room that might make it audible, intelligible, or not. Uh, so in this setup, in order to measure the speech transmission index, what we have is a modulated signal with a given modulation depth. Okay, so we go from the loudest point to silence. The frequencies should be between 0.6 and 12.5 hertz. Okay, and typically you would take a few different values there when you measure and then average those. Uh, so what you do actually is you have a fixed uh, source, a fixed receiver, right? And then you transmit a signal. You can also do a broadband noise. You can also do different bands and integrate over that. There's multiple approaches here. But the point is that you have a modulation loud, silent, loud, silent. 
at one of those frequencies in between and then you just record that signal and you look at the amplitude and what you get typically is a smaller modulation depth so it the speech transmission index is actually the loss of modulation depth in a given situation does that make sense do you, if i have to compare it it's like the weight of the reserve in a sense like it's just the reflection like minus the directional so I don't understand minus, but I understood everything until then, which was okay. kind of... Not minus, but you know, like it's just the, the reflection of the reverb rather than like how it's... it's you cannot say the reflection of the reverb. Reverb doesn't have a reflection. Okay. Reverb is a set of reflections. So, so every time you ask this question in terms of uh, asking for affirmation, I'm afraid that most of the time your, your expressions are inaccurate and ambiguous. Uh, right? Well, yeah, you know, this is why we're here for, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's so reverb. There's there's no such thing as reflections of the reverb. Reverb is a set of reflections. So indeed, in this case, the reflections will add up to reduce the depth of modulation. Cool. You want to do a bit of math. So if we think about C fifty. To which frequency would that relate? What do you mean exactly? I don't understand. Well, if you if you so if you look at C fifty, right? What are you looking at? You're looking at the level of reflections within fifty milliseconds and the level after fifty milliseconds. Okay. So if you think about it here, right? If you want a frequency that corresponds to the C50, right? Then you would actually be measuring in the dip, right? So if I have, let's say, if I have one hertz modulation frequency, right? Then this will be one second. So this will be half a second. So that's 500 milliseconds, okay? So you see, you're actually measuring much more much deeper, I should say, into the reverb than 50 milliseconds with speech transmission index. I mean, it's, it's kind of a complex thing to compare the two in different situations, but it might be a worth brain exercise. So I'll accelerate now like an idiot because there's nine minutes left. So that's all about speech transmission index. One is excellent, zero is really bad. Just you know, we have these facts of life. Now, early lateral energy fraction. Hello, acoustics, lovely things. Uh, this is a measure that will tell you something about the envelopment that you get within the room or indeed what they use in uh, venues, which we will talk about. Well, it's just that. It's a metaphor that describes how you hear sound. You feel enveloped by sound. So if you have a lot of lateral reflections, which means sideway reflections, you will have a sense of uh, either wide sound source or indeed envelopment such that you are in the sound rather than outside of it and it's coming at you. Okay, so here we have a similar thing that we have two different time constants. We have two different uh, SPLs thus, but here, they're not both omnidirectional uh, receivers. We have a figure of eight receiver, right? So that's why we are able to distinguish between sideways and uh, otherwise reflections. So if you have a figure of eight microphone, you place it such that it captures the sideways, right? And then you can measure sum of pressure between five and 80 sideways, and then you measure sum of pressure omni, and then you see what is the ratio of lateral reflections to all the rest. And this is what we call early lateral energy fraction or uh, room envelopment, maybe. Uh, and in any case, it's a similar thing. So if you have more sideway reflections, you will get a lusher sound. You will be more enveloped by it. Okay? Uh, and yeah, you can do it twice. You can do it at different spots. There's many things to do.
Well, f uh, figure of eight is supposed to f supposed to be exactly sideways on the sound source, so it doesn't catch the direct sound; it catches only the lateral things. I mean, only mainly. Okay, and then you can have, and then we get into uh, essentially uh, sound levels. I'm not sure how interesting this is to you, but I will summarize it with this. So essentially, what we have a percentile measure. I don't know if that is a term you've encountered before. So we have an L90, which is your background uh, level measurement. These are the, the three uh, continuous level measurements that we typically use in acoustics. And this is a situation, this is a recording of a full day uh, near a road. Okay, so these, these are the times of the day. So what you have is what you typically expect is that at night, the background level, noise levels are lesser. Now what you have here is typically few different things. One thing is the time frame, the averaging time frame, which is crucial. And the other trick is the percentile. Okay, so the way we define 90 percentile is that 10% of the signal is louder than that. Actually, it's easier to uh, explain it here. So these are different percentiles, L90, L50, and L10, and this is my sound pressure level over time. So the way these are defined is by saying that overall, in this case, 90% of the sound is above that threshold, and that threshold is 90 percentile. Okay? So what this does it allows you to exclude very loud instantaneous noises, okay? So what you see then in the comparison of these measurements is that here, I think they said that these are uh, ambulance cars at night, right? So you have a very low uh, level of background noise, but suddenly there are huge noises. So you see how actually only the L90, which is your typical background level, uh, metric, only L90 will exclude the ambulance car at night from its estimation. The other two, we have the maximum uh, level, will follow those uh, uh, occurrences and the equal level as well. Okay, so that's a bit of a detail just so you have some idea in terms of acoustics. A lot of the acoustics goes into, you know, nuisance noise levels like this, levels like this, regulations and stuff like this. Uh, some of this will be explained in the architectural acoustics class. I think it will be in December. Okay, so thank you for your attention and kind comments. Uh, I've just checked, we do have fuzz measure installed in 1 and 52. So we will start the practical there, 1 and 52. So if you go 1 and 71 on the right and you go full left towards the end of that corridor. Okay, I will put a note on 71 as well. So we'll have a slightly better working environment there. All right? So I'll see you at 1 o'clock.